Welcome to Business Rockstars. I'm Alex Worley, joined by John Taffer, CEO of Taffer Media. Thanks so much for being here. Good to be here, Alex. I'm always happy to talk about business. Yes. Well, we're going to dive right in. You are a successful businessman. You've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs who have experienced quite a few challenges. So what do you think it takes to be a successful entrepreneur? You know, uh, I was asked, what are the three words that defines an entrepreneur? And to me, the three words that define it are make it happen. Mm. So we have to make things happen. So when we wake up in the morning with an idea, you know, we have to think of it as a seed. So, so we have to take the idea, we have to turn it into paper. Then we have to turn it into financials. Then we have to turn it into a pitch. Then we have to turn it into capital and money. Then we have to turn it into an operation. Then we have to run the operation. Then we have to sell the operation and exit from the operation. We have to make thousands of things happen every day. The entrepreneur who is the most successful is the one who makes the most things happen every day. Oh, that's really good. So I always ask entrepreneurs about the fear of failure because it's real. It holds a lot of entrepreneurs back, including the ones that are watching and listening right now. So it's timely because you just gave a speech on the common denominator for this fear. And what is that? You know, to me, the, the, the common denominator of failure is excuses. So years ago, when I had all my restaurants, we had a line on my daily revenue report for comments. And they would write, snowing, no business. Then the next day they would write cold, no business. Then the next day they would write first nice day, no business. And I learned if you give somebody a line for an excuse, they'll use it every time. So I took the line off the piece of paper because there are no excuses in business. Fact of the matter is when we fail, it's because of us and the choices we make, the decisions we make, the people we hire, the things we do and don't do. So Passing blame, to me, is, is the most influential element of causing failure. That's incredible. And obviously, you've made small mistakes along the way, but you haven't had any of these major failures the way that some of these bars have that you've worked with, and you attribute it to this. You haven't made successes or excuses, excuse me. Uh, would you say that there were a couple instances where you could have made excuses and it could have sent you down a completely different path that are standing out? You know, I think that, that make no mistake, when I was young, I didn't have this wisdom. You know, this is yeah. 30 years in the business that has taught me, you know, about the failure and such, you bet I made those mistakes. You know, when I was young, I would over project my revenues, mm -hmm. take investor money. Then when I didn't hit the numbers, no, none of my numbers worked. You know, I would over promise, I would under deliver until I learned to under promise and over deliver. That's maturity, you know, and it takes experience to be able to, to, to be humble in how you present yourself and then overdo it in the way you execute yourself. Most of us, you know, expand upon the initial part and then disappoint on the execution part. So if you could go back and give your early entrepreneurial self-advice, what would you say to yourself? Don't hesitate. Mm -hmm. And let me explain what I mean. You know, I gave a, a, a speech at a political fundraiser last year, and we talked about the fact that 720,000 businesses closed in America last year, only 650,000 opened. And the fact that 60% that of small businesses 10 years ago, 2009, 2010, were owned by families, today only 42% are. Why? So when we pick that apart, we look at the last years of what I call tentativeness. Whether you like Obamacare or not, the tentativeness of it caused people to hesitate. They didn't go into businesses, they didn't expand them, because what was going to happen? They didn't understand mm -hmm. it. The tentativeness of politics, who's going to win? What are they going to do? Are taxes going to go up? Are they going to cause people to freeze? So when there's tentativeness in our lives, we get caution and we, we stop acting. So people stopped opening businesses in this environment of tentativeness, of pause, if you will. If there's anything I would tell myself as, as a wiser businessman to a younger businessman, it's don't pause. Keep Just going. move forward. Bingo. Don't let anyone else pause you. You have to create the pace and the energy. Don't let the outside environment do that. Mm, that's good. If you were to create a startup toolkit for an entrepreneur, tangible, intangible, what would be inside of it? Ooh, that's a great question. You know, first of all, I'd probably put an accountant inside of it. And the reason why is, in my view, 
and in my business, the restaurant and bar business, about 70% of independent operators don't even look at a P&L every month, don't even look at management reports every month. Where entrepreneurs fail is they envision the business, they envision the customers, they envision the experience, they envision all the things that are wonderful to them. But most businesses fail, not because they're bad businesses, but because they ran out of money. So I owned a restaurant, one of the first ones I ever owned years ago. And it was doing $6 million a year, but when it opened, I couldn't manage it effectively. I was young. So I sold 50% of it for $150,000. And then we sold the restaurant for millions of dollars two years later. Had I budgeted myself correctly, I wouldn't have run out of money. So I suggest to you that businesses are like football games. You don't lose. You just run out of time. If you had enough money for two more months, you might have figured it out. You mm. might have solved the issues. So many businesses fail that wouldn't have failed if they just had the capital for a few more months. Well, let's talk about that because coming up with the capital is a real struggle for a lot of entrepreneurs, but we're not going to make that excuse because we don't make excuses. Right. So what do you do if that's a struggle for you? Where do you begin? Well, you know, there's a lot of places to begin. You know, first of all, there's pre-orders and pre-selling. Today, there's websites where you can pitch ideas and you can raise capital before you even create a business. So there's opportunities today to sell an idea and generate money just on the idea. Before these internet opportunities of raising funds online, you couldn't do that. There was no raising money on ideas, mm -hmm. <laughs> on dreams, on words. We had to have substance, financials, documents, business plans, references, due diligence. So today, I suggest that there's almost a greater environment to raise money, if you think about it, because the world is at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. So from your very computer at your own desk, think of the thousands of people you can touch if your idea is strong enough. Yeah. So I suggest that the way we raise money is different today. But I think the universe in which each of us interact to raise money is far larger. Well, so much more to talk about, but we have to take a quick break. I'm Alex Worley, and this is Business Rockstars. Welcome back to Business Rockstars. I'm Alex Worley, continuing my conversation with John Taffer, CEO of Taffer Media. How important is building a strong team to you and how do you go about it? You know, team is critical. And I always say when I'm involved in family businesses that family shouldn't be in business. Reason being that families nurture each other in weakness. Oh, Alex did her best. Oh, Alex doesn't feel well today. Ah, oh, give Alex a break. A team, I'm going to bench you if you don't hit the ball. So team is the right word. And I suggest that no families, no businesses are families. They're all teams. So I love that you say that word. So the way you create a team is very simple. And I'll tell a story that Tommy Lasorda once said to me about a baseball player who hadn't hit in eight games. But he was going to batting practice every day, extra time. He was there extra hours every day. And Tommy Lasorda said to him, you don't get paid to swing the bat. You get paid to hit the ball. If you don't hit the ball, I'm going to bench you no matter how much you swing. In our business, we have to have the courage to say no more. I am not putting that employee out anymore. I am not going to experience a lack of standards. And we have to be able to sever the ties that pull us down. Ooh, so it's a very tough love approach. Yes. And the fact of the matter is if employees don't work, you have to move on. Yeah, and it's interesting what you said about family, that there's a lot of family businesses, but they shouldn't treat them like family businesses. So you're not saying that you shouldn't go into business with your family, no. just have the right mindset. The, within the four walls of that business, you're not family, you're a team. Then be a family outside the, the building. But within the four walls of that business, there's no question, you got to come through for each other. Mm, yeah. Right. And that's not a place to nurture weakness. Right. Who would you say has been your number one mentor and what has been the best advice they've given you? To me, I look at multifaceted people. Mm -hmm. Walt Disney is another idol of mine. You know, when I look at, at, at contemporary environments, Stephen Jobs is an idol of mine. You know, anyone who can be a Pied Piper mm -hmm. and present an idea, but get people to rally around that idea is very special. Yeah. All of the individuals you just mentioned, they're, they've been disruptive. They've been innovative. Do you think that's important for an entrepreneur to be disruptive and innovative? Yes. And how do you do that? Well, first of all, you have to establish an envelope, right? So, so you have to establish an envelope of human behavior and then innovate within it. 
Right? I'm not going to get you to do an interview with me with your hair sticking straight up with an electromagnet over your head. You're just not going to do that. You're so, right. so there, there are parameters of behavior that I can expect mm -hmm. from you. So how do I take you to the edges of those to provide you with a more dynamic experience than you normally have without crossing it? Because the minute I cross it, I lose you forever. So innovation is wonderful, but every innovation has to be contained by some customer behavior factor. Can you give us an example in the hospitality industry, maybe what direction it's going, where there's the ability to stretch a little bit? Sure. You know, uh, uh, big mega bars are disappearing all over the world. Not Nightclubs are disappearing all over the world. And the trend is more for intimacy. And if we take a look at the sociological impact of it, you know, to me, Starbucks has changed the bar business. Because Starbucks conditions college students and people 16, 17 years old on a Friday night to sit around the small table sipping beverages as we talk. Mm -hmm. So it's a preconditioning for that social environment of a bar. But since they're growing up consuming beverages in these smaller, intimate, lower energy coffee shops, they stay in those environments. So we're seeing a, a, a much greater trend to, to, to less energetic, more intimate environments. The other thing that's interesting about the food and beverage is the impact of millennials. And the fact that millennials seem to have very little brand loyalty. They'll walk by McDonald's to go to Shake Shack because it's cooler, even if it costs twice the money. They'll buy a craft beer that's reviewed terribly because it's hip. And it's three times the price of the beer that's reviewed better. You see, in today's marketplace, people buy relevancy more than products. They buy hipness. They buy importance. They buy relevancy. So if I can buy this product, that, but it costs $3 more, but it makes me relevant... I'm in. And belonging. And I think community has become such a big thing. Wanting yes. to be a part of something. In the example you gave, that's cool. Or the craft beer community or yeah. the culinary. So, you know, yeah. I'm, 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 so, so we have to understand how emotional transactions are today. Mm -hmm. And that perceived value outweighs absolute value now. Yeah. Same size hamburger, same bun, same plate, $4 more in a hip place. Four dollars less than the unhit place. Absolute value disappears and perceived value takes over. Very interesting. Well, let's end with this. What would you say has been your biggest success throughout your entire career? I have to say bar rescue, surprisingly. And the reason why is, first of all, I thought I'd do a pilot and go home. And last week I finished my 150th episode. Congratulations. Thank you. 77 million people watched Bar Rescue last season, which to me is the greatest compliment that I could ever have. You know, yeah. Incredible flattery. I've never been hugged by so many people like I have been through the Bar Rescue experience. It's the most rewarding thing I've ever done as well. Well, and then your reach goes beyond the bars to all the people watching, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, so it means a lot to me. Awesome. John, thank you so much for stopping by. Pleasure meeting you and, you know, hearing all of your business insights. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Let's do it again. Let's do it. I'm Alex Worley, and this is Business Rockstars. Business Rockstars.